the future and you look better. You look better. It was uh, 2013 in December that I discovered uh, from a doctor's visit that I had chronic kidney disease. And the doctor said, if it doesn't get any better, you'll have to go on dialysis. By January the 8th, 2014, uh, that was my first dialysis session. I couldn't believe this was happening. I didn't know this was a part of my future. And I said, God, I got too many dreams, too many visions to be bogged down like this three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, four and five hours a day, and, and then trying to recuperate from the session to do the work of God. But one day while I was at dialysis, the Lord spoke to me and said, you will not be on dialysis more than six months. Now, I must tell you that the, the brother beside me had been on dialysis for 10 years and some others in the same room that I was in, nobody had been on dialysis less than 10 years. There was one lady, 15, one 17, there was one 20. Uh, one lady, they had just celebrated 30 years of being on dialysis. And when God spoke that to me, the devil responded by saying, so you think that all these people have been on dialysis all these years and you're going to come in here and, and, and spend just six months? I said, well, if God said it, I believe it. And that settles it. And what I didn't realize is the miracle that I needed was in my house. My wife was tested and we discovered that she was a perfect match for me. And so June, June 24th, 2014, we did the surgery. The surgery was a success. I ran into some complications after the, service, the surgery because uh, fluid from the kidney had leaked in my lungs. My lungs were 90% full and so I was drowning. They put me on a ventilator. I couldn't keep up with the breathing and so I died flatlined dead, dead. My sisters were running out of the room crying and screaming. My brother's dead. One of the surgeons went upstairs to tell my wife what had just happened. Just coming out of surgery, she sits up in her bed and says to the surgeon, he can't die. God is not finished with him yet. And so she said to the, to the nurse, put me in a wheelchair and take me to him. On her way to my room, God spoke to her and said, anoint him with oil, but don't look at his face. She came in the room, anointed me with oil, and then the nurse says, we got a pulse. God brought me back to life. And my wife is here with me. Stand up, honey. This is my, this is, this is my miracle. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Look at somebody and tell them God still works miracles. Come on, clap your hands and praise him for that. Hallelujah. Very briefly, I want you to join me in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, 27. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 27. And it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. For just a few moments, I want to talk to you from this subject, the power of choice. Will you say that with me? The power of choice. You know, one of the first four commandments that God gave to mankind is found right here in our text this morning. The first command was to be fruitful. That means to be productive. The second command God gave to mankind was to multiply and replenish the earth. That's probably one of the uh, 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 only commandments that we've never messed up. Amen. And then, and then the third command of mankind was to subdue, to subdue. And that means to conquer. Uh, that, means, that means we're not to be defeated by anything in life. 
but we are to conquer. And then the fourth command that God gave to mankind was to have dominion. Dominion comes from the word domain. And domain means territory. And so God placed man on earth because he wanted us, amen, to have dominion on earth. And, 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 and that also means to manage, management. Dominion is management. And so that means that oftentimes your life is what it is based on how you were a manager. Somebody say amen. And, 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 and so God gave man these first four commands so that he could have a productive life, so he could live to the fullest, and so he could fulfill God's purpose and God's destiny, amen, for his life. But one of the greatest gifts that God ever gave to mankind was the gift of choice. We know it as free will, free will, free will to choose, free will to decide, free will to make decisions in life. And one of the things we must understand is that it was important that God would give us uh, free will is because worship cannot be genuine without it. If we did not have free will, then our worship would be forced. So that way, if we, uh, when we get to heaven and God would ask us, why did you worship me? If I didn't have free will, I would have to say I had no choice. But because we have free will when we get to heaven and God says, why did you worship me? We can all say because I chose to. See, free will is the only thing that you and I have that God does not claim ownership over. He owns the house. He owns the car. He owns the money. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. So what can I give to God to show my gratitude and appreciation for who he is and all the things that he has done for me is to give him the one thing that I have that he does not own and that is my worship. And so that's why we lift our hands and give glory to God. That's why we lift our hands and give praise to God, amen, because he has given to us the ability, amen, to choose. But decisions can be dangerous. Decisions can be dangerous when you do not filter them through the word of God. The Bible says, in all of our ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct our path. It is important that we go to God, amen, before we make final decisions because he sees what we do not see. He knows what we do not know, amen. Even as it relates to a, a, a mate, a husband, or a wife, it's good to go to God first because when you meet somebody, you really don't meet the real person. You meet their representative. You meet who they want you to believe they are. Amen, somebody. And I know some of you, amen, amen, may be living with the consequences of your choices. Uh, you can't say amen because you sit next to them, but God's going to bless you before this, this moment is over. <laughs> and so it's important, amen, that when we make our decisions and we make our choices, that we filter them, amen, through the word of God. Because sometimes choices are driven by desire. Choices sometimes are driven by uh, evil or lustful desires. And when your choices are driven by lustful desires, you got to be careful. Because you really do not count up the cost. And you're not concerned about the consequences. The book of James puts it like this. James says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 
See, you can make a bad decision to do something wrong and not reap the consequence of it right away. Because the text says sin is not finished yet. And sometimes sin will wait until it completely destroy you and cause you to lose, amen, everything. The word lust is an appetite for what is forbidden. And Paul talks about it like this in his epistle. He says, when I would do good, evil is always present. And seems to be the thing that I don't want to do is the thing that I end up doing. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body, amen, of this death. Sometimes when your decisions are driven by lustful and, and evil desires, oftentimes you can actually know the consequence. But because of your deep desire, you become numb to the harvest that you've got to reap. And so we say things like this, I'll just make the decision and deal with the consequences later. But what I have discovered is that sometimes consequences have consequences. And you, you, you cannot always judge what the consequence is going to be. God told Adam and Eve not to partake of the forbidden fruit. The Bible says Satan, amen, uh, uh, he tempted Eve and, and he came at her through the three deadly temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And she made a decision to partake of the forbidden fruit. But she actually knew the consequence before she did it. But because she was driven by her desire to be wise, she became numb to the consequence. Because God had already told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. It is amazing to me how a man, a lustful desire, a man can numb you to death as a consequence. But she knew that death would be the consequence, but what she did not know is that her consequence had consequence. Because later on, she would have two sons, Cain and Abel. And one of the consequences that she had no idea is that one day her son, Cain, would kill his brother. And now before her death, she has got to grieve the death of her own son. And then her other son, amen, Abel, amen, was cursed and he was driven to the land of Nod. It is important that we make wise decisions because sometimes consequences have consequences. And then one of the things we are encouraged not to do, and that is to ever make choices, amen, that is driven by your pain. Because sometimes you can be discouraged and sometimes you can just be going through a, 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 a deep, painful moment. And, and I've learned that's not a good time to make certain decisions because uh, uh, sometimes during those times, you only make decisions to bring you temporary relief and not long term. But the Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And then David says in Psalm 61 and 2, he says, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. He said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So sometimes it's not good to make, amen, decisions in the midst of your pain, amen. And, 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 and sometimes it's just good to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. When I found out I had kidney disease, I told the church one Sunday morning, I said, God is going to do one of two things. I said, either he's going to deliver me from it or he's going to give me the grace to go through it. And either way is victory. Amen, somebody. And then sometimes bad choices are driven by time. And you got to be careful.
careful when you make choices because of time. See, when God has made you a promise and when God has given you a dream and a vision and it seems like it did not come to fruition in the allotted time you thought it should take, you got to be careful about decisions that you make. You've got to learn how to plant your feet and wait until the manifestation comes. Because if God said it, it's going to come to pass. And one of the things that the enemy is betting on is that if enough time passes, you'll give up on it. But look at somebody there telling him, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. God promised Abraham and his wife, Sarah, a son. From the beginning, his name was Abram. Abram meant he was an exalted father, but he had no son. And names in biblical days were a little more significant than names today. We only call folks stuff we can't afford, like, hello, Diamond, come here, uh, Alexis. You see... But in biblical days, name meant something. So Abram meant that he was an exalted father. And you can imagine people teasing him because his name was Abram, but he had no son. And then all of a sudden he says, God is changing my name from Abram to Abraham. Now they must have thought he was really crazy because Abram meant he was an exalted father, had no son. Now Abraham meant that you are a father of many nations and you still have no son. But here's the thing. Sometimes God gives you the name before he gives you what goes with it. And you've got to learn how to walk in the name and not make crazy choices while you're waiting on the manifestation. So one day his wife, y'all know the story, one day his wife comes to him and says, Abram, listen, I'm not getting any younger. And if, if we're going to do this, we better do this. And so finally she comes up with this choice, this decision, this, this idea. Why don't you go into my handmaiden and, and let's have a son. Now brothers, now brothers. All I can say is, when Sarah said to Abraham, go into my handmaiden and, and bear a son. He probably said something like this, you, you sure? You, you sure? <laughs> but anyhow, but anyhow, now here comes Ishmael. Ishmael is born. They made a decision to help God out and bore Ishmael. But the problem with Ishmael is he's not the promise. He's the problem. He's the problem because just because Ishmael came doesn't mean Isaac is not coming. And just as God said it, Isaac came along. So here's the question. What are you going to do when the problem is, in, is in, in effect? But here comes a promise. And now you got a problem and a promise. Would you look toward your neighbor and just tell them, do not create a problem while you're waiting for the promise. Uh, you got to take God at his word. The prodigal son decided that he wanted all of the goods that, that fell to him and he left and went out in the world and spent all of his money. So much so until he found himself at the hog pen. Thinking about all of the bad choices that he had made. But his turning point, and that's what I hear God saying to me to tell somebody here today, there's a turning point in your life. Yes, you made some bad choices. Yes, you made some bad decisions. Yes, you may be reaping the consequences of some choices that you made, but I come to prophesy to you today, there's a turning point. But the turning point is when he came to himself and said, I'm going back to my father and I'm going to repent 
and tell him I've done wrong. And the Bible says that the son was restored because he knew he had made bad choices. Now let me close. Someone may be saying, Pastor, all of that sounds good. But I've been careful about the choices I've made. I've been careful to make sure that I filter my decisions through the word of God. But that's not my problem. I, I, I just want to know what do you do when choices choose you that you didn't choose? See, many of us, we go through some things, amen, situations and circumstances that brings grief and that brings pain, not because you made a decision, but because it chose you. Amen, somebody. Well, all I can tell you uh, this morning is that uh, you may have dealt with and is dealing with some things that have chosen you. But will you tell somebody, you still got a choice. It may be bad, but you still got a choice. It may not look good, but you still got a choice. You see, Joseph, amen, he didn't choose to be hated by his brothers. He didn't choose to be thrown in a pit. Joseph did not choose to be lied on by Potiphar's wife. He did not choose to be thrown into prison. But every time Joseph went through a man of circumstance that chose him that he did not choose. But what he did do is he made a choice that no matter what my condition is, I'm going to keep on serving God. I'm going to keep on loving God. And finally, when he stood before the Pharaoh, all the good choices that he made in his trouble led him, amen, to, amen, his destiny. And when his brothers stood before him, nervous because of what they had done, they thought he would take their lives. But Joseph looked at his brothers and said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for my good. Somebody shout glory. And I just want to tell somebody today that no matter what you've been through in your life, no matter what you had to suffer in your life, you still have a choice. And my choice is to serve the Lord. David said, I bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continue in my mouth and I just got a question that I want to ask you today do you choose to serve him do you choose to love him do you choose to praise him and if praising him is your choice why don't you put your hands together and bless the name of the Lord somebody shout yeah I'm finished. The power of choice. Tell your neighbor, you do have a choice. You do have a choice. And you can choose to demonstrate your faithfulness and your obedience to God in any circumstance that you find yourself in. I didn't 
choose dialysis. One of my worst days at dialysis was when I was being dialyzed and the enemy, he just, he would wait till I get to dialysis and he'd beat me up. He said, so you started preaching when you were how old? Eight. And, and, and this is how God shows you love? I mean, he beat me up. He said, I thought he loved you. And I said, devil, we got to get something straight. I said, you'll never convince me that the God I've been serving and preaching about is going to leave me in the state that I'm in. I said, I said, but just for the record, if he chooses not to do anything, if he chooses not to give me a miracle, I choose to bless him. I'll still praise him. I'll still live for him. Because if he never does another thing, he's done enough already for me to praise him for the rest of my life. And then I said, devil, I may be on dialysis. I said, but this man over here, he's on dialysis, but he has, he has a, a, a oxygen. He has to carry around every day. I said, but I can breathe on my own. I said, this lady over here, she's on dialysis. I said, but she's in a wheelchair. I said, but I can get out and drive. Another man came in on a gurney. I said, listen, I may be on dialysis, but they just brought him in on a gurney. I said, but I can walk out of here. I said, so no matter what you're in, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. You can praise God no matter how bad it is. Touch two people and tell them I choose. I choose to bless him. I choose to praise him.